Welcome to episode nine of The Lowdown Show. I'm Neil Graham. My guest this week is Jack Morris, a young designer who grew up in a small town just across the border from Buffalo and who found his way to Europe where he designed KTM ADV bikes. He since moved on and is currently designing electric motocrossers for a startup called Stark. But before we dive in, a word from our sponsor. eBay Motors is here for the ride with some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love. You transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Shall we take the plunge? How did you get into motorcycles? What, what's your first memory of a motorcycle? First memory... Hmm. Well, of course, uh, as a pretty classic story, but uh, my father was into them, so they were around when I was was young. There was a lot of, always a couple Harleys in the garage, and uh, and therefore it's I guess got passed down to me. Now, your father. I looked at your Instagram. Now, your father looks like a proper yeah. a proper biker. He's, he's <laughs> there's there's an image there. Of, I think he's sitting on a th three wheeled Harley. Yeah, he's on the trike, and that's and he's got a serious yeah. beards running the family, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So he's, a, yeah. he's he's a serious looking guy, and you're from a small town, uh, not far from Buffalo. Um, yep. And so, just was there all, were always bikes around? Were, were motorcycles sort of in the culture of your family? Yeah, for him, for sure, they were around a lot when he was a bit younger. Of course, like also like a like a good father, he kind of stopped riding when he had a, a couple of young boys. Uh, which is fair enough, but uh, maybe it was also the the restriction that he had on them that made me desire them more, right? When sometimes when you it's like a a secret or a bit taboo to be like oh, I shouldn't be doing that because I have other obligations. It makes you kind of desire it more, right? So so it was uh it was around always in the background and lots of things of 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 that, but it's not like it was a uh, daily conversation or something crazy or it was my whole life and I was destined I wasn't that into it my my whole life I was always around it but uh never like that's the only topic or something crazy like that <laughs> so, so so as a young a young man you weren't desperate to be a, a motorcyclist necessarily no no not necessarily so which came first for you was it uh an interest in motorcycling or was it an interest in design how, how did that happen actually an interest interest in design. I think coming from, as you mentioned, a small town in Canada, uh, it's not like my neighbor or, or the guy down the street was a motorcycle designer. That's a, a cool dream, but you don't really even think about it uh, then. So uh, as I say, my, my father was into bikes, but my, my mother was always uh, creative and kind of making our house always you know very creative in how she made it look nice and kept everything uh everything was a project between my dad built it and my mom kind of designed it and i i didn't realize how that was influencing me until i until i was finishing up high school and then you have to start to think what do i want to do <laughs> and uh yeah it was kind of a combination of of those but originally it was it was more actually in in school when you're younger you have art class and that i was kind of excelling in and everyone was saying wow you're so good at drawing and blah 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 you know the, the typical feedback of you should be an artist and honestly i i thought yeah could be could be cool right but you i knew kind of that wasn't totally who i was because i was also quite practical i don't know I, I i liked uh kind of the real world and and the things going on i wasn't uh kind of i didn't feel like a pure artist yeah, at that time. So you weren't, it wasn't abstract expressionism that got you going? No, it was something in between. And at that, that point, I, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> but then, of course, when you discover industrial design, as we've, we've went over, that it's uh, once you kind of discover that the, the, everything around us is designed, you say, well, I want to be a part of that. And, and yeah. We, yeah, just to bring people up to speed, we talked about this notion of, of industrial design. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I'm friends with a Michael Ularica, uh, motorcycle designer, worked at Yamaha, mm -hmm. who's been on, has been on the, this podcast. 
Mm -hmm. And I think it's through Michael that I really had my eyes open that everything is truly designed. And we don't think about it, do we? You know, everything, doorknobs and the handle on the fridge and I mean, everything, flower pots. And yet mm -hmm. it's almost invisible to us, which is, I think, really fascinating to me. And did you have that same sort of awareness as well to design? I, I didn't have it. And uh, actually, I can uh, give a good shout out to my guidance counselor in high school because I went to her and uh actually she did she impacted my whole life so she said my my principal's son uh his name was michael defazio he's a good friend of mine now but he he is uh he was studying industrial design at uh, carleton university in ottawa and she said wow if you're into creative but practical as i mentioned then this is the perfect career for you it's it's tangible but you still need to to be all those skills and once I heard about that, it was kind of uh, more or less a clear path. I mean, that's what it was when I was 17. So I was pretty lucky to discover it <laughs> that young, uh, what I wanted to do. And yeah, we're at how many ever years later? And and it's uh, it's uh, been a pretty clear path then, since. Yeah. So you went to design school. Um, yeah. And then how did you end up going to Europe? And where did you land in Europe? Well, so, okay, I went to Humber College in Toronto, a little little design school that had the option of taking transportation design, and that's where I kind of uh, discovered, okay, not only is there industrial design, but there's automotive design. And I was still hesitant because, obviously, there's not too much transportation design in Canada. Uh, but I went for it anyways because kind of the group of kids that were going into transportation design and the teachers and stuff, I thought it was a better challenge, even if I were to end up being a product designer. And uh, I did for a while, I did product design at a few internships. I worked at BlackBerry. Uh, and actually there I worked with my uh, principal's son, Michael DeFazio. And I told him the story. I said, I'm, I'm working with him now, but I said, uh, you're the reason that I'm, I'm doing this career. So it was a, <laughs> right. a, fun, a fun full circle moment. So I did a couple internships, uh, product design. And then uh, uh, basically, we had uh, one graduate from my school who who went to uh, Umeå in Sweden, and then worked worked a few years uh, around in the automotive industry and ended up at Kiska. He wasn't necessarily a motorcycle designer, but uh, yeah, he was he was doing transportation design at the at at Kiska, which is uh, obviously in Europe, <laughs> as you asked. And yeah, he passed he passed uh, around some some good deeds back to the school in, in little uh, Humber College and gave some kind of like classes and he came back and taught for a while and I had him as a teacher and okay, long story short, through he pulled in someone else and then a few other people and it kind of started this dream from Humber and uh, yeah, I was obviously uh, pretty pretty actively trying to, to uh, get that opportunity and eventually I got it as an internship, so a six-month internship to to Kiska in, in Salzburg. Explain the significance. Kiska, of course, doesn't make motorcycles. A lot of people don't know the name. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Explain <laughs> uh, for our listeners what Kiska is and what they do. Well, for me, it was it's a at that time it was a playground for for creatives, especially people who like motorcycles. It's the biggest uh, design firm in Europe for motorcycles, and they're primary client is the pure mobility group so KTM Husqvarna and and Gas Gas and they basically do all creative work for them uh, so from graphic design to the on the bikes to the actual bikes and they have a full full blown studio and everything everything goes through them and yeah so explain to me so you're, you're this kid from Canada you end up in Europe mm -hmm. you end up at, at mm -hmm. Kiska mm -hmm. What sort of things do you start doing? You know, in your first month or your first six months, what sort of projects do you end up working on? Are you sketching all the time? Or are you working on a turn signal lens? Give us a sense of, of what sort of projects you dealt with initially. Well, so I really wanted the job afterwards. So I was working uh, almost all of the time. <laughs> when work stopped, <laughs> you keep working on, uh, yeah, to impress, right? You, you It's a tough, it's not a, a job that you kind of just get <laughs> you you have to dedicate some serious energy and serious efforts too and 
prove that you're kind of, you know, the one that should be at the front of the line for the next. So, the so next you had to, process. you had, you had to fight for the job essentially to stay there. I, I would say, yes. I mean, <laughs> it was, it was pretty, uh, the, one of the best six months of my life, the first, the first internship, cause you meet a lot of people all around the world and it's, but it was also incredibly demanding and, and very stressful, but yeah, I kind of thrive in that. So, so for me, it was fun. Uh, what, what we did in the first six months. Well, as an intern, okay, whether you're designing a part on a bike or kind of the whole bike, you, it's sort of the same process, just on a small scale or a very big scale. So I don't know. Yeah. Let's say you do, I don't know. I was given some parts. Uh, let's say you are doing a turn signal. It's kind of, you do some research on the current ones. You understand what kind of bike it is, what the needs are. Uh, and you work with the engineers or you get a maybe you get a package maybe you don't depending on the ideation like how early it is in the project and you start sketching up different ideas different solutions the way it looks the way it functions and you go back and forth uh with with management when you're an intern you show it to maybe a, a senior but when you're a senior you show it to the the ceo or however it is but it's actually the same so even though you're just doing a part sometimes an intern you say oh i thought i was going to do full bikes here but you have to give it your all and show that you can uh, kind of be ready to take the next step. And then maybe you do a slightly more important part and then eventually you support on a bike and then eventually you do a bike and then eventually you lead a bike and it goes on and on. So I'm quite a bit further down that line now. And I, and I went through those, those steps at Kiska. Uh, but uh, so it was mainly parts. And then of course they give you some, juice let's say some some juicy projects to sketch on a ideation of a bike of, of some sorts and uh so you do get a bit of both but what's now me looking back uh what's really measurable is how hard someone works on the part that matters less because this shows kind of, <laughs> kind of obviously you're going to work hard if you get a bike ideation you sketch the next uh super duke or whatever it is it's kind of easy to check if you're motivated or work hard then but if you if you do it on a turn signal then yeah you show some potential <laughs> so you start off small and then yeah. you 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 work your way and so what is the process of a of a full bike design so what and what is the relationship between i mean obviously you can sketch yeah. whatever you, so so here, here's the thing mm -hmm. that interests me about industrial design you can, and you, I've seen your drawings and you can draw, which is, I hate you because you can draw and I can't and <laughs> always wish I could, but you, you can sketch something. And of course it's free and cheap. You can do anything when you're sketching. Mm -hmm. So how does that sketch go into a, a real motorcycle? What are the sort of the phases that, that it, it goes through to become a real thing in a showroom? Well, it's a question that could be answered. A million in different ways for a million hours, probably. <laughs> right, I understand. Well, just but, give us the give us yeah, the sort of the, yeah, the yeah. broad I'll strokes. Try. Okay, I'll try. Okay, there's a balance between when a junior does it or an intern, as I was then, and how I would do it now. And the cool part about knowing nothing is you sketch something crazy. The bad part about that is most of the time, it doesn't work. They just say no because ah oh, maybe it's cool, but come on, we can't build that, or it doesn't make any sense, or that. But every once in a while, you get a nugget from an intern who's 18 and has this idea that no one came up with because he doesn't know anything. And he knows this would be super cool naively. Now, after you spend uh, seven or eight years and you know too much about the industry, it's the opposite. You do a sketch, maybe you only do a few, and you know what will work and where you're kind of pushing the limits. Uh, and, and that's kind of a big difference between having a, a range in a team and a range of mindsets, a range of people who ride a lot, a range of people who don't. I personally like the path of, of riding a lot and learning a lot. So I like to sketch things that, that work. I'm not a crazy, okay, I conceptual in my, my way of thinking, but I don't do bikes for 2050 that float and that kind of stuff it's not what uh excites me i want to do i want to do why, real bikes why, yeah that's why i had you on here i thought we were going to talk yeah. about the floating bike <laughs> yeah. The, yeah the the hover bike right yeah <laughs> for me it's uh it's such a discipline yeah not a sci-fi artist right. so much i'm more of a, as i say a, a designer who wants to for sure work on the next but the next real tangible bike so that's a bit about the, the difference but from a sketch to a 
uh, a production, it goes through like one. It I would sum it up a little bit as like a bike is a a decision is is a, a decision to make it, but then what follows that is like one million other decisions from a lot of different people in a lot of different uh, mindsets of production or cost or design or engineering or you name the 10 other other um, uh, departments. But for me, what's key is that the product uh, manager and the designer nail the intention so well in the product that it's clear for everyone what the intention of the product is. And there's there's few bikes that do that, but when a bike is incredibly pure, I don't know, a Penegale or a, you know something along these lines, you feel that there was no one in that process that didn't understand what this bike was. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Now here's the part where I tell a heartwarming story about uh, something of interest. Uh, let's talk about electrification. Uh, there isn't anything more polarizing. Uh, if you want to get 340 comments on adbrider.com, uh, mention electrification. And if you mention that you're for electrification, you will be vilified uh, because of course it's a, it's a political issue. If you like electrification or if you have interest in it, you're seen as a left-leaning communist. And if you uh, actually uh, don't think electrification is uh, at all possible or of interest or even interest in being interested in it, then of course you are a redneck Republican. That's the cliche. Um, it's unfortunate because it's just a propulsion system. It's like steam, internal combustion, electricity. In my mind, who cares? So I'm, the story I'm going to tell is about the, uh, uh, when I ran a magazine, we, we bought a little mini bike, gas powered mini bike that was so gutless it couldn't move us. So we gave it to a community college and they electrified it. And it, the power was so violent um, that they had to put wheelie bars on it. And it was an absolute hoot to ride, although petrifying because there was, you know, wasn't really any sophistication in the software that made it work. So it was, um, it was truly terrifying. Zero to 15 miles an hour, probably the fastest thing I've ever ridden, um, you know, more than a GSX-R1000. So that was fun. Alrighty, so with over 122 million parts, you can make sure your number one ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof racks, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Now back to my conversation with Jack Morris. You're listening to The Lowdown Show. One of the uh, things that I've heard designers talk about, industrial designers, and specifically mm -hmm. motorcycle designers, is understanding what the bike is for. And sometimes... Um, there have bikes that have started out and it seems like they never had a, and I think we know these bikes because we look at them and think, who's that for, or what's that for? Mm -hmm. But this notion of, of that, they sort of start off in a spot that maybe not be the right spot. And then it, it just, it never seems like a cohesive whole. Did you, have you ever had that experience where you've been working on something and it just was sort of outside of your grasp? And then, you know, you talked about a bike like the Panigale, which I think is beautiful, mm -hmm. which, which is really a focused design. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, have you had that experience of things that sort of started strange and then the other side of it as well? I've been pretty fortunate in my <laughs> career working for mainly KTM and now, now Stark that their products are pretty extreme. They're pretty direct, uh, where I would say, yeah, it's pretty likely this performs in this way and we want to be number one in category of adventure riding or of uh, of uh, off-road riding or these these brands as much as uh, I strive to make them more clear on my projects. Uh, they, they, they're pretty clear where, where and, and they go for the loud, the loud um, screaming markets that that are that are clear. Who does this maybe much uh, more in an interesting way is, okay, it's Honda, for example. Like they they somehow do the research so well that they find markets that, that maybe me and you that are freaks about bikes don't see. Mm. And a company like Stark and KTM has a bunch of freaks in it. They, they love bikes. They're super passionate about bikes. And they want to make a Panigale or a whatever, the, the, the extreme ends. But... The, the 
bikes that uh, sell huge and kind of are are miraculous in their in their approach, both in the way they look, because sometimes they don't look spectacular at all. But maybe that's a good thing. Uh, maybe it, it doesn't need to be a statement. It's already a pretty crazy two-wheeled thing that uh, has explosions between your legs. Like may maybe it's enough. Maybe it doesn't need to be uh, uh, red as well and super fast looking. You know, it, maybe it's already a big step for a lot of people to just simply buy a bike. And uh, that's where you, you start with Honda on whatever any of their entrance bikes are. And we, I think I've, I would safe to say that me and you wouldn't even look at these, right? But they're yes. selling way more than any of the bikes that uh, we we consider to be amazing. Let's bring this conversation up to the current day. You um, take take me through the process of of leaving Kiska and then where you mm -hmm. where you've landed. I think it, it's it's a a shift in in the industry uh, that that kind of drove me to be. I, I think KTM had many years of success and they still are, uh, but they can't hide the fact that they've been around quite some years and they're in a, a rhythm and you kind of can't fight that as a, as a company grows it gets into its its thing you do you have these segments and you do the next adventure or the next duke and uh and i learned so so much from that and i i really liked it but what i what i want to to be is i mean this is i think one of the most exciting times i feel really lucky to be a part of the industry right now that is every company is struggling to make this decision on how do we do electric when uh maybe they're even behind on their gas models they want to make a new midweight but do we develop the midweight or do we develop the electric and it's it's very how do we develop the electric the sales are bad on electric oh we don't know but we know we have to do it and i don't know what a better time to to be that so for me in in the two wheel space I wanted to find the the kind of best way to be on the forefront of that. And for me, already being a bit experienced in, in off-road, and I thought that Stark, uh, Stark's vision on, on that success was, uh, was the most appropriate for the battery technology today. So I, I, I get that, uh, I, I get that people are scared that without the noise and the vibrations and that there'll be less emotion in the product but i think it's even better challenge for companies and for designers to make more emotion in the product how it behaves how it looks how it acts that uh, we have to still make a product even better even more usable even more fun with this new technology and i i, I think i just i just love the challenge i'm gonna jump in now tell uh yeah you started talking about Stark, but explain to people what Stark is. Ah, okay, yeah. So Stark, we uh, were a company when I joined. I think I'm the ninth employee or something like that. So <laughs> pretty. There was lots of people helping out at the beginning, but officially, uh, something like that. I don't know. Now we're, I guess, 200 or something around the world. I, I can't exactly say, but yeah, a lot of people now and we move buildings and we're at a big factory and we do electric, uh, an electric motocross bike that uh, basically in all ways uh, outperforms all of the gas, uh, the gas uh, competitors. So from, from Yamaha and Honda and KTM and so on, we, we, strive and we succeed to to outperform in performance and uh we make the most powerful the powerful bike so we're proving that electric tech can be uh more mm, enticing and and better performing and better looking well well being sustainable and uh yeah making giving some hope <laughs> well it seems to me that that and i don't have a ton of experience with electrification but mm -hmm. it seems to me that, uh, I mean, battery range is still an issue with mm -hmm. electric vehicles, yeah. uh, electric motorcycles, particularly, because where do you put it? And obviously, we have to balance these things. They can't weigh 3,000 pounds. Sure. So, it, but it seems to me that a motocross bike, which which has a limited runtime, and you're always going to, you're on a racetrack, you're always mm -hmm. close to a place to charge it. It would seem that that's one of the few places with electrification that actually makes sense to me. And is that kind of what drew you to it? Uh, yeah, exactly. Like the the, so each year that goes by, battery technology gets better. And let's say it passes new thresholds on what product is 
making sense. So a pit bike, for example, a 50cc bike, the, the Cirons, I don't know if you know what a Ciron is. This yes, little, yes. Yeah, so like this, as soon as battery technology passed a certain threshold, these products were viable and now they're they're super accessible and basically if you want to make a good electric product today you look at what bike has a small fuel tank and for sure you can make a bike on that and but but it's only a matter of time before more and more products with mid-sized fuel tanks and larger fuel tanks uh are viable too and that one's going to change with gas in another 10 years it's going to be the same the performance might be worse because emissions are going to be worse uh Every, everything about it's going to be you're going to get taxed a lot more and uh well i don't get into the regulations but for me uh each year is going to be better for electric and each year is going to be worse than gas and i, I see this happening and yeah i want to be a part of the the, the change not the the past right well i would think you know for a young designer how old are you yeah. i'm 29 so for a young designer, to me, to me, this would be an amazing time because you're, you yeah. know, it's it's not often that a propulsion system changes. I mean, no. you know, internal combustion has been around forever. And, and further to that, it almost mm. seems to me like the, you know, in internal combustion motorcycles, there's the rise of the parallel twin engine, which mm. was kind of dead at one point, and then it's come mm. back. I think mm. it's the absolutely most boring engine configuration. It is. Yeah, it totally is. Yeah. It it it's characterless. It's soulless. V twins, V fours, as far as I'm concerned, are the way to go. I'd even take a single over mm -hmm. a parallel twin, and and it makes me. And I know people are going to fight me on this one, uh, which is fine. I I agree with you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, but but is it, it have and you can tell me from the inside, but it almost mm -hmm. seems to me that companies have lost enthusiasm for internal combustion engines. Yeah. <laughs> uh... I think each company is faced with a really tough decision right now. Cars as well, they're they're developing platforms that can potentially they're they're down the middle. So if the electric stuff takes off, they can make it an electric car. If the gas stuff takes off, they can make it a gas car. There, there's a lot of strategies like this that are just kind of inherently a compromise. Uh, so these are you saying they're almost placeholders? Yeah, yeah, they're ready until to they change. can be electrified. Yeah, or or if the electric stuff tanks because people are still unsure, which I guess fair. I don't really believe in the, the numbers. I think electric's pretty clear, and sometimes you can get into like what's logical, but that doesn't really logic is not what drives us. What drives us is yeah the the polit like the general motion of the the society, and that's it's pretty decided in 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 my opinions the, that. Uh, we're going towards electric, at least for the coming years. I mean, who knows in another 50 or 100, but the, the coming years, everyone's still hoping that. So, but there, there's a lot of uh, big, big strategic decisions on which way to go. I mean, it's a much bigger one when you talk about cars, like huge numbers, and they share platforms across companies and massive, right. massive, uh, massive investments. And to invest that much, you want to make sure it's going to work for both. But yeah, that that inherently is exactly what we're talking about. The decision is not inspired at all by what will make the best car. It's what will hopefully, you know, kind of sell and work. So they're hedging their they're hedging their bets. Yeah, they're, they're hedging their bets. And I guess in companies that scale, I mean, I'm not here to say uh, whether that makes sense or not, but I'm here to say that that's boring. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I, that's what I see with with yeah. real twins. I I just think these yeah. it's almost like. You know, where's the, and this is kind of why I love Ducati and Aprilia, you know, mm -hmm. and companies like that, because, you know, that Aprilia V4 is, I think, the finest engine that's ever put into anything. Um, it's, and it's I, I don't own, I don't yeah. own one, but, you know. No, it's a, like, it definitely, uh, you you feel something when you ride it. and that's you, you certainly do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. It's, it's not the, not too many feelings like that. But so, just, yeah. Go ahead. I would, I would say I I got to say something about the the parallel. Please. <laughs> I think like the whole industry kind of almost forgot about it because it was deemed yeah like the perception was cheap and boring and now with mm, at least with like the mid range of KTM I, I'm quite familiar with of course and they did make something quite 
for for it like a spine frame over the top like a middle frame with a parallel twin it's like the most standard motorcycle you can make so it's pretty impressive but it but it has a lot of reasons why you would do that as well uh for compactness and and cost and everything else they did make a pretty dynamic product so it's i think a lot of people are coming back with it now because engines do perform quite well so you can make some emotion and some level of that on a parallel twin where some years you, ju you just couldn't you just couldn't make a bike that was desirable on that i i feel but well no you're you're right and i'm being dismissive yeah. but you're right the 270 yeah. degree crankshafts which kind of give it a firing order that sort of emulates a v-twin is, mm -hmm. is certainly and i know triumph does that just i don't know if ktm mm -hmm. does but but it, it you know it, it definitely imbues the bikes with more character so it, mm -hmm. it's true um mm -hmm. Now, one of the things you know that we talked about this changing of propulsion systems, and you, you as a mm -hmm. young guy coming along, I mean, is there is there a different design language for electric vehicles than internal mm -hmm. combustion? Well, specifically motorcycles, mm -hmm. because you know the because the motorcycle has an exposed engine, mm -hmm. except it, unless it's a fully fared sport bike, and even then, there's often you see sort of little bits of an engine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and these things like, you know, induction systems and exhaust systems and even radiators, I mean, they're all mm -hmm. part of what we think a motorcycle looks like. Mm -hmm. Now, when all of that stuff is gone, and I thought the earliest electric bikes looked weird to me because they were like, where's the exhaust pipe? Because mm -hmm. that's so much a part of what I, I want to see it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as a designer, is, is that a great opportunity? Is it a challenge? Is it both? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So what what I like to, okay, I'll answer the first question, which is, is de design language changing, which I think in the, the first tries we see in cars, everyone got like a little bit too excited. So a little bit too weird, like almost they felt like it had to look like it's coming out of the movie Avatar or something thereby, like it needs some green accents or some blue turquoise colors. And the shapes need to look more from the future because it's it has a new propulsion system. Yeah, like why did the why did that why, yeah. did, the, why did the Prius have to look so stupid? Yeah, exactly. Like they, made it, like, they made it look they made it look like the wimpiest car ever made. It's like, yeah. like don't don't blame electricity for that car. Yeah, exactly. Like, and then you're <laughs> yeah you're so, yeah exactly. So, and then and then kind of. Uh, Many people are doing it now, but I would say obviously Tesla is famous for coming with the Roadster first. So a premium car that looks like a car and a sports performance car. And people kind of realize like, okay, maybe like, like for pertaining to motorcycles. Okay. It's, it's still a motorcycle. The two wheel invention didn't change and it's still a motor and it's still a cycle. It's, it's, <laughs> right. it's, it's just that it's electric now. So there are some changes but it's still it's still the same invention it's it doesn't necessarily mean a whole new look uh, you you can do that if you want you can use an excuse to really stand out and say we're changing our whole company strategy and we want everyone to know it we want you to see that this is something new but it kind of doesn't work so uh, in fact at, at, at stark i can say like we want it to just be a nice bike like here here they want it to be a nice motorcycle not uh alien or weird it should be human it should be beautiful it should be amazing and we, the 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 kind of bikes in this segment are pretty aggressive and kind of look like big toys it's like a kawasaki motocross bike or or yamaha or so they look like a kind of grown up toys and we want to be more sophisticated and human and kind of look more premium than those and well i would i would i would agree with yeah. that i mean i think motocross bikes look like they're designed for 10 year olds mm -hmm. designed by 10 year olds <laughs> yeah they and, are and, a little and yeah. and the stark I, and i i haven't i i just spent some before knowing i was going to talk to you i spent some time mm -hmm. looking at some starks and they're actually really beautiful looking bikes and mm. they almost look to me more like Oh, I don't know, like a Ducati sport bike versus a Japanese sport bike. Mm -hmm. That that yeah. kind of relationship. Totally, and and we saw this as a uh, Stark Stark saw this as a big opportunity to to yeah, kind of uplift the perception of electric, right? To I mean, Tesla did it by making electric sexy, and I think uh, Stark did this in this space that that now 
we have some top riders in the world on our bike and it's kind of hard to argue when they're riding and it looks good. I mean, where, where are the negatives anymore? You know, okay. You, you do have a little bit less range, but you don't have the service. You don't have the noise. You don't have the problems. You, it's way easier to ride. It's way more fun to ride. So the negative is just range and range will solve itself in some years. So the next generation will be hard to find a negative. I mean, charge time versus fueling a bike still a little bit more difficult or it takes a bit more time. So there will be some applications for long haul, whatever kind of stuff you might, might want to still use a gas bike. But if you, if you have the choice and you have both in your garage, I'm telling you, you're, you're going to, you're going to pick the Stark at the track. It's, it's just a way less stress experience. So, so for me, the, but, yeah, we can get back to the original <laughs> question about. Uh, but I, I forgot. I've yeah. forgotten what the question was. Now, what, yeah, did, what yeah. was the question <laughs> about uh, the designing the different the different? Yeah, design. Yeah, design. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The design language is. Yeah. I mean, is yeah. it? Is it? You've yeah. got different components to deal with, but you still. Yeah. I mean, you still want to make it look mechanical, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So. You still want the bike to look like trustworthy. You don't want to like make a motor look like it's a. Uh, uh, I don't know something that it's not right you don't want to make it look the motor look like it's a, just a frame i don't know <laughs> or a body part you you want to know that's a strong powerful motor and that's a battery and you still kind of want to make those pieces look honest to what they are mm, but i would say when when i was finishing up my my time at at ktm i was thinking I'm so happy that I don't have to work with an airbox anymore with an exhaust <laughs> with an exhaust heat cone with a fuel tank and how it's injected molded or so like and all the regulations around those and then you get here and you start to really like I, I did do some was involved in some electric projects at KTM as well so I wasn't totally totally out of the loop but then you start to do it here and and then you're just swearing around batteries and inverters and <laughs> different problems so there is a portion of the bike that is new and will drive the shape change and the visual change but lights uh, uh kind of all of handlebar all of the seat area ergonomics so where your knees go where you touch on the bike i mean every every all of that honestly isn't any different obviously going from a, a company like kiska which is a very large company to a mm. very small company like mm. uh, stark where you are now mm -hmm. what's the culture and we we've you know, over here in North America, you know, we're very familiar with Silicon Valley and all the startups and all mm. the crashes of startups. And of course, there have been a lot of electric motorcycle crashes recently. I mean, it, the company's crashing, mm. not the bike's crashing. Just ah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Cake was a recent one that, that went mm -hmm. under. What is the cultural difference of working from Kiska to Stark? I mean, how does it, how does it mm. differ from your point of view? I guess like everything in life, there's positives and negatives to to both. Uh, at the at the established company, you have kind of safety, right? You know you're going to do a bike, and uh, I don't know, kind of you're you're focused on your job, so you focus on being a designer. I'm I'm a designer, and I sketch all day. I come up with hopefully cool bikes and and designs all day. And at Stark. You, you do that or you come up with an idea and it's a small team. It's it's one bike now you're doing now. It's not 12 projects going on or, or a few projects. I mean, but it's obviously not the scale of, of KTM and not yet, of course. <laughs> but you can, uh, you can, you can, you can yeah. hope, right? You can yeah, hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have big goals. And, uh, and now, okay, you want to do a light. You, you don't know. Uh, where to begin and you don't have any established uh, well you know where to begin okay it's a light but you you don't have any uh, team already formed that's been doing lights for the last 10 bikes you don't have a supplier you don't have uh, yeah kind of anything in line so you have to and then on top of that you're a new you're a new company and you want to be cutting edge and you want to stand out so not only do you not have anything in line you also say, here's all the lights out there, but this could stretch to any part or any bike. Now we have to not know how to do this. We don't have the team. We don't have the experience, but we need to be better than everyone else. 
<laughs> and that's what a startup that's what a startup is like so you can imagine it's a lot of hitting the wall and loops and uh a lot of um believing in what you're doing and believing that you can do that even though on paper it makes no sense you think how and then you try and you fail and uh timelines are not quite as rigid because because how do you how do you plan when you haven't done something before you 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 try your best to be on time but sometimes you you can't you know what before we shipped we were we were kind of nobody and we could only get certain suppliers because we just have to make them believe in our vision now at least we're shipping and we can say okay we're this company and we're going to have this many units and and we can kind of you know convince some people hey we're these these cool guys with this cool bike and it's totally mm, the approach you kind of at the startup have to look around every day gauge the the what's happening and be a lot more flexible and uh, wear just just many more more hats than than at the other one where it's pretty clear every day okay i'm designing this part for this bike that's had five generations before and uh, you have your influence but of course you you do it on that one bike and now uh you do it uh Hopefully on, on a much bigger scale, that's the dream of going to the startup is that you influence and you're a part of a lot more of the process, even though it's a lot more, you're figuring it out yourself. So you're not even sure if it's kind of deemed the right way, but sometimes the right way is just the way you can, you can get it done. At Stark, where do you see the, the company growing in terms of its model range? Um, where, what are the goals for, for Stark? I will have to give you the, uh, the, kind of company message then and and what our ambition is as as stark and that's basically to to enter uh, make a full range of of streets and off-road bikes so to scale as quickly as we can and accelerate the the and pressure the change to the motorcycle industry to switch to sustainable technology so we want to do that by uh proving that the bikes can be uh as i've already discuss that they can outperform the gas ones so uh in in all in all measures so in performance but also in usability in simplicity in design and we think we can we can do that in in quite a few categories for more information about stark motorcycles visit starkfuture.com in closing a word from our sponsor ebay motors is here for the ride with some elbow grease fresh installs and a whole lot of love you transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own brake kits led headlights whatever you need ebay motors has it and with ebay guaranteed fit it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time every time or your money back plus at these prices you're burning rubber and not cash keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only and exclusions apply thank you for listening to the lowdown show